Hello, everybody. Um, I hope it's not too disappointing that I will talk in English. Uh, my Russian is not so good. Um, and I want to thank uh, the Tractoria Foundation and Konstantin for inviting uh, me and making all this possible. Um, and uh, so I will try to, uh, so it's the first time I give this uh, talk, so it's also the first time for you to listen to this. And I will uh, put a lot of effort in uh, trying to be easy. And if you didn't understand something, ask me a question later. And um, the topic um, of the talk is that you uh, have uh, the question about how to make an animal, right? Uh, it's uh, here symbolized with a uh, familiar, you're likely more familiar with the egg than the chicken. Uh, depends where you grew up and um, yeah and this is the major question and I want to give you uh, uh, an insight into what how we nowadays understand how an animal develops and um, one of the interesting questions is of course also how do you make this diversity and uh, how do you make different bodies of animals uh, in the development and how is are these patterns generated how do you make an animal which have six legs and uh, or animals which have four legs or even wings and things like this so here you see a broad diversity of how animals can look like and there is of course a much broader diversity as well uh, on, in, in nature. We have about 10 million species estimated of animals and, uh, but we may mainly study only a few of these animals which is mainly the fruit fly you see here. Um, so I, I, the fly you can detect, right? Because I ha don't have a pointer here, maybe I will uh, use one, but it's of course difficult with these back, backlight screens. And uh, the fruit fly as well studies, and here you can see a rabbit as well. Uh, uh, so people usually study the mouse uh, and or rat development instead, but uh, there's only a little bit of embryology known of rabbits. So. The question is, of course, uh, so humans are also animals, and uh, uh, you see, this is the way how you make an animal, and how you were also made uh, uh, over some times of like nine months, and then you hatch, uh, kind of, and then you grow up, and you are able even to listen and understand these talks. And um, the, I, I try to pin it down to, the main question which is like, uh, you need to transfer of information to make an animal. So from an egg to an adult, you need information, okay? And this information has to be transferred as well. So you also need communication. And then of course, uh, the main question is, so what is this information, which for example, makes the position of the arm? How, how is it uh, during embryonic development clear, made clear and also safely clear that the arm is growing here and not somewhere on the back? Then, who is communicating? It's like, what are the units of life and uh, how do you organize an embryo like this? And how is this information communicated? So what are the mechanisms used to position and transfer the information between the units. So, um, and it should be clear, and this is not only my bias as a molecular biologist, but the information is carried by molecules, okay? So here, uh, I show you different kinds of molecules. In the middle, you see uh, the DNA, the, the, uh, the molecule, the hum huge molecule you have packed in chromosomes in cells. And this is kind of the, the backbone of the information, the storage of information, right? So in this uh, DNA molecule, everything of information is stored and then it is recalled during the development and also recalled now in your cells because this is also important. And then you have uh, molecules which uh, up there is a hormone and hormones are also essential uh, molecules which also make it clear 
how, for example, a caterpillar turns into a butterfly and when this timing happens, right? And this is exactly uh, the egg dye zone, the molting molecule, molting hormone, which insects are using for making and triggering the uh, transformation from the caterpillar to a pupa and from the pupa to the butterfly. And, but these hormones have to be also received, so the information has to be received. And this is uh, down there on the bottom right, you have uh, the ectizone receptor molecule. So this is a huge protein which then receives uh, this signal and then tells the cell what to do after. And then we have also smaller peptides like this one there, which is a neuropeptide, which is used for signaling between the nervous system, for example, and other areas. So different kinds of molecules are important to pass over the information between uh, the units. And how the storage is uh, transferred is that you have this huge information in the chromosome, which is here, the DNA, and then this DNA gets transcribed into smaller molecules, which is this mRNA or messenger RNA. Messenger is clear, so it's, uh, it's transferring the information from the nucleus to the areas where the proteins are made. So when you eat protein-rich food, this is mainly the stuff what uh, here is the protein. And the proteins are the machines, right? They are the executioners which make then specific processes and also build the information as well. So now I show you the key players of development and these are cells. So the cell is the unit of life and uh, it is in principle everything what is not a cell is not a living being, okay? But everything what is alive is also a cell or contains cells. And uh, when you stain them with some colors, they look beautiful, of course, but uh, there's a lot of more information in these cells. And here I show you a cell, uh, which is a cell, kind of an adult cell, which is in the body. And here are some features, what they can do. So the storage is in the uh, nucleus, this pinkish area. And then you have the membrane outside, and this membrane has also holes and some receptors which are, can bind uh, where these other signaling pathways can bind and they also can secrete these cells so they can release other molecules, okay? And this is the key play also in the development of to make an animal because an animal is composed out of many, many cells. And uh, now I show you and you can guess, right? Because I said not all animals or uh, things are always composed out of many cells. But sometimes you have here uh, a single cell which is predating on a multicellular animal. So this poor thing contains about 600 cells, which is a rotifer, a wheel-bearing animal. And this, the predator, is only a single cell. So this is a ciliate, which is, you can see also the size. So this is about the same size, but one uh, organism is only one cell, and the, others, the other organism is 600 cells. So one cell eats 600. And uh, when you wait a little bit, then you will see that this whole organism can swallow, or the cell swallows the other animal, and uh, can eat it and digest it. Yes, not this, vice no, not vice versa. So the single cell on animal, which is the one on the right, is eating the other animal, which has 600 cells, okay? So this is to show you that a single cell can be very, very complex and can do many things. These are highly specialized, and here it swallows it. And these are highly specialized organism, uh, cells sometimes, but from in, during the development and how to make a multicellular animal, you start from a simple organized cell which has many functions and can become many different things. 
So, um, so what is necessary then to make a multicellular animal, right? Because when, uh, when an animal can also be only one cell, uh, so what is important uh, that you ha can make many cells, right? And the essential part is that cells to build us, for example, have to cooperate and make also shape, right? So although this single cell you have seen in the video before had already a specific shape, but to build our uh, body, it takes much more communication, information and shape building. So cell-cell communication is essential for making an animal. And now I show you a short animation, which I made by myself. So this is uh, a cell talk, right? You can see it. Cell talk, which means uh, the left cell, which is symbolized by the square, will talk to the other cell, to the right cell. And they do this using molecules. And I mentioned that the molecules are the carrier of the information and that there are different molecules in place. So now watch what happens with the signaling factors. So these signaling factors bind to receptors. These give a trigger to the cell inside and then there are transcription factors binding to the DNA and making the cell different. So you saw the change of the color, which indicates that the neighbor cell uh, gets the information and does something and becomes maybe a different cell. And uh, this cell-cell communication is happening. So the key information here on the slide, although it's a little bit complicated, means that it's always the same mechanism. So you start with a ligand, which is a signaling factor, which is floating around between the cells. These ligands bind to receptors and to the cell surface. And not all ligands can bind to all receptors, so they are specialized combinational codes. And then these ligands are also different. But, uh, and then you have the effector molecule, which transfers it from the receptor to the cell. And then the targets are the areas on the chromosome which read out the information. But here this slide shows you, you see one, two, three, four, five, uh, five uh, pathways. Um, and the important point here, there are not many more. So these are the five essential pathways which all animals use during their development to communicate between cells. And now you can imagine, so how are these five pathways making these complicated bodies which you see when you just go out in the forest and see birds and insects flying around? They are all made by only these five signaling factors, right? So you don't need to remember them, but the key here is five, okay? And this is... Uh, in principle, how you can see this information, right? So, so you have an address, so the signaling factor is binding to specific cells. This is like you have to write an address on an envelope. Then you have the content. So there's an inf important information uh, in this message, which then gets transferred to the cell, and it's a delivery, right? And this can be changed according, for example, the timing or also the concentration. So here the concentration is essential and uh, so different concentration can make, can be read out by different cells and then become something different. So the delivery of this information and now I go to the inner part of the cells. Again, uh, the, the schematic uh, area. So the transfer of information with a signaling factor I have shown before. So there are only five of these uh, pathways. But then there are many, many more genes which are on the DNA and which can be read out to make an organism. And, oops. So, there are specific molecules in the cell which bind to the DNA and depending on which combination of these factors, you can turn other genes on 
or off. And here is just a picture of these uh, symbolized by these uh, uh, images that you can have activators, so molecules which uh, activate genes, and then you can also have repressors, so molecules when they bind to DNA, they switch off. And here you see already a glimpse of what is possible and how you can make with these five pathways only and a bunch of 300 transcription factors that you can make different combinatorial codes which then give the information to other cells and then build finally an animal. And this is the way, and then of course, to shape, to form shape, these cells which have to be, of course, some features to, for example, contract, like in our musculature, for example. When I do this lift with the arm or when I talk, muscles are contracting and relaxing so that, uh, and these have to be signaled, and these contractions are in every cell uh, available. And this is also important to, for example, during the development to make an animal to form an arm, okay? So the information here is that you can contract cells in a specific region and when you tell a cell to contract, you can make shapes like things ingress into the body, etc. So these are the essential things. And uh, here again, the diversity of animals. And now I will give you a little bit of insight into like uh, how, how do uh, animals like develop, right? They go through specific steps. And here in the next slide, you see developmental stages. So embryos of these animals. And here are they. And they are also sorted according to the phases through which the development comes. So here, for example, the first row, the upper row, is the stage called cleavage, uh, where the fertilized zygote so starts making the first division, right? And then the next row is the phase, because then you have a ball of cells. And the goal is to form inner organs like the digestive system or the musculature. You need to put cells from outside to the inside of the animal and also to form cavities. And this phase is called gastrulation. And then after this, some animals are forming dispersal stages like larvae, for example. And we know the caterpillar from, uh, for example, from uh, butterflies, they are machines for getting nutrients in to then make this beautiful butterfly or less beautiful butterfly. And I will not talk much about lava, I decided not to make it too complicated today, so then I will go and also talk about organogenesis. So, because then when you have inside cells and outside cells, then these cells need to know what to do in which area of the body and how to do this shape. Okay, so, but what was not on this picture is the fertilization, okay? This has to happen before. This is kind of the activation of the egg, right? I hope the word is correct. So to remind you what fertilization is, is that you have a bunch of sperm and only one sperm has to enter and activate the oocyte. And if you have many sperms entering, then it will not work because there's too much information in the cell and they don't, the cell doesn't know how to deal with uh, additional information. So the fertilization is an important step in development. It's a starting point. And I will not talk much about it. I just want to show you that our picture, what we see in movies, etc., from sperm, they don't always look like human sperm, right? So here on the left side, we have different morphologies from different animals, uh, and uh, this shows you a diversity of how a sperm can look like. So it can look like a Christmas tree, it can be like only single cells which is without this long tail, like crawling sperm, like uh, they don't even have this tail. For example, in nematodes you have sperm, which is a cell which is just crawling around, okay? So, and then, but all of them, they hit at some point the oocyte and then transfer the information which is in this super small cell to the big oocyte. And this is here important. You see the 
uh, uh, relation of the size, you have one sperm only hitting a huge, huge cell. Okay. And uh, what I also want to highlight now is that uh, there is the mother which produces the eggs, gives already information to the oocyte, which are, is essential for making an animal. And this process is called oogenesis, so the egg making, okay? And here we have a, a fruit fly which is uh, studied extremely well, uh, a model animal, uh, and many people, over 3,000 laboratories on the world uh, work on this animal. And therefore, we know a lot about this animal and also how the fly makes the eggs. And here you see how the eggs are made. So they have, of course, ovaries, and then these eggs are built up to this end product. But here in blue, you see already that there is some information given from during this development of the egg into the, uh, into the egg from the mother, which determines one of the most important things, which is a primary axis. So a body axis, which is important, and you see this, one top to bottom, and this is the animal vegetal axis or anterior posterior axis, and this is often in many animals the first identification and coordinate system which is put by the mother into the cell. And here you see this blue stuff, which is information. And uh, this is the whole process where you have first some cell divisions and then you have nurse cells. So cells which are only there to produce yolk, like egg yolk, for example, and putting this information into the egg. And then you have on the opposite side molecules here, for example, the so-called EGF pathway, which is putting some information for making the axis and telling the axis, uh, the egg, the axis, future axis of the body, so axis, so. And here are the molecules which are playing the key role here in the fly to determine where is anterior and where is posterior, so where is the front of the fly and where is the back of the fly. So where to put later the head and where to put the tail and the wings. So now I show you a movie of the development of a very uh, important animal, which is a nematode, Xenohapteltis uh, elegans. And we can see uh, that morphology, uh, oops, this is wrong, so this is the wrong word, so it should be genome, right? The genetic information is transferred into the morphology via the development. And this is a development of this worm, so you see how the cells divide, and then there are already cells immigrated into the egg, and then you form slightly, slowly, the shape of the worm, and then it hatches out of the egg. And this is a nematode uh, which you have. And um, this is how the cells divide and give rise to new cells. And this is called the cell lineage of the worm. So there was a person, John Salston, who was sitting in front of the microscope and looking at each cell division of this worm. He didn't have a video recording. He was looking, taking another embryo, looking and wrote down in notes how ah, this cell is now dividing into this cell. And then ah, this neighbor cell is doing this cell division in this direction and forms this cell. And he built up this whole tree, which is the cell lineage of the worm. And for this kind of work, you can get the Nobel Prize, which he also got, right? John Salson got the Nobel Prize for this and studying how the cell tree works and how it works out to form a worm. What we don't have, uh, I mean, of course, during this whole process of the development, again, the cells need to know what they have to do at each time of the development. So the information has to be transferred at each phase of the development to each cell in this worm, okay? And this is happening with these molecules, and now I show you a different movie uh, 
uh, of another worm and this is a cleavage stage and then you have also here the shape formation and this will become a gastrotrich which is uh, well, another worm and then it hatches out of the egg and then you have of course the information giving to the animal and then when you take this embryo apart you see already regionalizations for example there's this ring of cells so each sphere indicates a cell which will form the nervous system then the inner part here is the digestive system the gut so you can analyze this development and now with video recording we have a much much better information and possibilities of studying the development of animals and there is also the microscopy which we can use nowadays is amazingly progressing and this is coming with uh, better computational power as well because we have uh, also we have to store all this data at some point and um, the, here is an example again from the fly in which phases it is subdivided uh, how this information of the, the cells is transferred. So we see these colorful embryos and the color of these photos is showing the expression of a specific gene, a transcription factor, which is informing the cell of what to become. And here you see that first there is the information which is put from the mother into the uh, uh, egg where you form the, pos, uh, the back part of the animal and the front part. And this is illustrated with a gradient of red and blue. And then this body is subdivided into additional regions so that the cells know I'm not uh, here in the front part of the uh, embryo, I'm sitting in the middle part because also in your body each cell has to know exactly where it is. And this is based on the specific imprinting from signals in your body. And then you have this complicated thing, and here also a Nobel Prize was uh, added to this. This is from Christiane Nisslein Vollhardt. She looked at mutants from this fly, and then finally also figured out all these gene cascades in the fly embryo. And um, this is how beautiful these uh, uh, development can look like when you label and stain some genes and this is the pattern of stripes which emerges and this is already advanced technology but in the next I show you a video of the development of the fruit fly which is done of, with the best microscopes you can have on this planet which is he didn't get yet a Nobel Prize maybe he will never it's Philip Keller from Janelia Farm and he did the movie which you will see now. And this is the uh, fly embryo which has already about 500-800 cells and now you see the morphogenesis and you see how these cells have to organize themselves to make a specific pattern and form the fly. Here the nervous system will be formed in the middle stripe and you can investigate these embryos from different angles at the same time. And this is a so-called light sheet microscope which uh, can, where you can trace each cell in the embryo throughout the whole development. So what John Salston did by hand on the microscope, nowadays you can do with a microscope and you record everything and then later you can analyze this, what's happening. And here you see how this will, and then of course when the muscles are formed, you will see that the embryo is contracting and then uh, uh, you see that the recording is then more difficult to do. But this is uh, how a fly is made and uh, then you have first uh, the larval stage which can crawl around and these are the first contractions of the embryo when it's clear musculature has been differentiated already and then you have these contractions and then it goes mad. So the first cell divisions are called cleavage and this is when uh, one cell stage then subdivides into the next stages. So it's a simple process of cell divisions. And here you see a video uh, which is already a four cell stage here. 
And um, this is how it works. So you have the subdivisions and then the new cells are born and at this time already the cells get their information. Each cell at this time knows already what about they will become. At least they know where they, if they will be in the anterior part or in the frontal part or in the back part of the animal which is born out of these embryos, which I will show you soon what it becomes. And you have here already the internal cells and it continues that you have cell divisions after cell divisions and uh, you also see the protection shell around this embryo where you have like, uh, so that nothing bad happens to this. And this is uh, what develops and hatches out of it. It is a larval stage, which is a dispersal stage, which is extending now and then it swims away. And this larva will swim around and then at the end become like a, a bryozoan animal, which uh, maybe you have seen them on shells, sometimes when you eat uh, mussels. You have on these mussels these animals sitting. They are of course dead when you boil the mussels. Uh, but these are beautiful animals and uh, this is just to show you what the development can do. But in cleavage stages, there's another important process happening because I told you already that there is anterior, posterior or front and back part information already put by the mother into the egg. But then you need another axis development. So for example, the cells in the body have to know if they are more on the back part or the frontal part. And this information is usually given during the cleavage process to the embryo and that, okay, you are, the, uh, the, you are along this axis, but then to make a bilateral symmetric animal, which is an animal which has a left and right axis and a back and a belly, for this you need additional information. And in this bryozoan, this is happening by this single cell which is labeled in bright, which is uh, making a specific pathway, the MAPK pathway, and it's expressing the pathway and telling the surrounding cells, hey, I'm the most back cell in the future embryo. And so you know that you are not in the back, you have to do other things, okay? And this is the information done just done by a single cell telling the other cells, hey, you should not become what I am, okay? Then I told you the next step is the time point where you have this ball of cells and you put cells inside the embryo to form the digestive system, for example, also the musculature. So all your inner organs have to, uh, were built by cells which integrate during embryogenesis into your body, okay? And this process is called gastrulation, right? One famous embryologist has said this is not birth, uh, not uh, marriage, not death, the most important thing in time, it's gastrulation. Obviously a nerd, Louis Wolpert, but uh, you see uh, that you have here some embryos gast gastrulate with only two cells, which then found the whole or inner organs and some embryos gastrulate with a whole sheet of cells. And there are already very, uh, a lot of differences between these embryos, what we find. And this is what happens. So this is like kind of uh, the information the cells receive during the gastrulation process. So here in these different colors are molecular information which is given to the cells, which then regionalizes already the digestive system. So here you see these cells integrate into the body and then the cells know already, okay, here the bright blue, I'm on the tip of the gut. Right? And I will later connect to form the mouth in the embryo. And here you also see what is important. You have the first shape changes. So to put cells from outside inside, uh, you have to contract at specific parts the cells on one end, and then you bend in the tissue and then you have the immigration also from other cells in this process. So, contraction here plays an important role and to make shape 
the sales have to these have to have these abilities to really make shapes and contract at specific parts. So this is the process of gas relation, and uh, when I show you these colors, right? These are four colors, right? And then, okay, this is fine. But in the background of all this information uh, during this process, I just show you a complicated picture, which is this one. And this is an interconnection of genes which are active during the process. So in the sea urchin, which just forms a spiny bulb uh, of an animal, which has nice gonads, which are tasty, uh, you have all this happening uh, in this uh, information cascade. And you see this is very complicated. I, of course, don't go into details, but this is what's going on in this cell. And this is, of course, also allowing variability, right? You, you can imagine that when you change something here in the pathway, also in evolution, you can make new animals because there's a lot of information happening during gastrulation. And here you see a gastrulation of a frog. So when cells uh, immigrate and now pay attention to this movie, what shape changes they are happening. So what you can imagine what information has to go through the cells to make these contractions and make the shape. And this was the gas relation and the next step is the neurolation. So because you know that the nervous system is also inside in our body and this also needs to be transferred and this is happening in the second phase here. So this is the gastrulation. This will form the digestive system and musculature. And now on the outside, this will be the nervous system, the backbone of the frog, right? And this also needs to integrate into the animal. And this is a lot of complicated changes. And then I, it's of course a question. So do these, I told you already that these animals are using five pathways only. And these are, in principle, the communication, the signaling wires, right? Like you, you have a phone line and you have an internet connection. So these are two. They have five. And then you need other factors. But this uh, is showing you these are specific transcription factors, which are the Hox genes. And here is such a Hox uh, transcription factor symbolized with these spirals, which binds to DNA and switches on genes. And this slide shows you that all animals use the same genes also for making, for example, the regionalization along the body. So you see the fruit fly, and this is what happened in uh, these developmental biologists who are specialized on studying these genes. They meet on conference, they are fly researchers, and then they meet mouse researchers who look at mouse development. And then they, hey, you are talking about the same genes. I, this is the same gene what I have, right, in my mouse. And then they communicated and then they discovered, wow, this is amazing. So the same genes are making the front to end patterning of a fly as well, which are expressed from front to the end in our backbone. So the identity so that the vertebrates, which make ribs, for example, are not here on the further back. This information is given by a combinational code of these Hox genes, which bind to DNA in a specific pattern. And then the cells know I'm not in the brain, I'm not in the belly, I'm in the back, in the vertebrae. I will make bones. Okay, and this is what the information is happening and transferred to the cells in this process. And now I show you another amazing movie from uh, the, the, also Philip Keller again from Janelia Farm, who studies also zebrafish development. And this is one of the most advanced microscopes. And this video just have been published uh, like two uh, months ago. Uh, and this, you will see, uh, you see a ton of cells, all these blue dots are cells. And then you have a specific label of some cells which will give rise to the nervous system. So this means you can track each cell in this embryo and then you can also identify 
using genetic labeling, which cells is becoming what and where are they at which time point of the development. So this is the outcome, but I will talk uh, here mainly about the, uh, I will show you how the nervous system is developing. So again, gastrulation, and now it's the nervous system, so they come, come together, these cells which are orange, and they of course do cell divisions, and then will form here the nervous system and this nervous system will integrate into the animal embryo, and that's it. So you can also see this from different angles, from the side, etc. and this is the shape changes. And this is just to remind you that there is a lot of shape changes necessary to form also a human. So this is a kidney, and you see that these kidneys are made by many, many channels, and each cell needs to know which position they are in. And here you see the development of our kidney, and then you have here specific regionalization. Each cell needs to know what they are doing, and these are the genes which are telling each cell and which correspond with the, between the cells to make a specific uh, outcome, namely a very complica complicated organ, our kidney, with all these channels and canals, and this of course has to be functional. Okay, and not only cell divisions, but also programmed cell death has a specific role. For example, our hands, when they develop, they start kind of as a bulb, uh, which looks like a fist, uh, but then, during the development, you have an outgrowth, and then, between the fingers here, you have programmed cell death. So there, suddenly, other cells tell these cells, you have to die. And then, you get in hand, right, out of this. And here, for example, you see how this develops. And here you see the area, here in uh, orange, the cells, which are told, you have to die now. And then the material gets engulfed, and then you have a specific uh, pattern. And this is also how shapes are made, namely the, our hand. And this is the same in horses, etc. so how this happens. And now I will come to uh, my let's, last slide of this presentation. And uh, I hope I told you already that it's a very complicated process which has to be organized uh, in a well uh, order, etc. And uh, uh, many things can go wrong. There are buffer areas where you have a control, where something, ah, this doesn't work really well, but then we have another pathway which jumps in. But sometimes, of course, now uh, it's also the most ugly picture, but it's a nice story. So you have the cases where things go wrong. And this is, of course, everybody knows this. You can have malformations during the development, which can affect many, many many organ systems. And also another thing is that cancer, for example, is an outcome of miscommunication and misidentification uh, of uh, cells in your body. So when you have, for example, a cell in your body getting the wrong information by mutation or something like this, you can have cancer as a disease, right? And this is uh, what's happening. And the same pathways which I've shown you before are also involved in cancer uh, uh, as a disease, right? Then signaling pathways are expressed too much, too much signaling is going on, and then you have these cells which go crazy, right, in your body. And this is not what we want. And this is an interesting case which combines kind of uh, these malformations with also cancer. And uh, this happened so, so in the US, in Idaho, there was a meadow, and the calves from the cows were eating there, and then uh, with a high frequency, there were calves born which only have a single eye, right, here. And this is this ugly picture on the slide. So there's a calf, a young calf with only a single eye. And what they figured out is that on this meadow, there's this plant uh, growing, right? And this plant has a side product, which is this molecule. And this molecule is interfering with an important developmental pathway, namely the hedgehog pathway. It stops it. It breaks up the communication of this pathway. 
during the development and then you have not a bilateral formation of two eyes, which, uh, uh, yeah, you all have this. And uh, so this miscommunication leads to the point that you have only a single eye exactly in the middle. And this is, of course, reminding us of Cyclopes, right? The, the uh, uh, Greek uh, fairy tale ad, uh, organisms or, or human-like organisms, which only have a single eye, right? And this is why also this uh, product, which was not known before, and this is, of course, based on science that the people figured out, ah, it's this molecule from this plant. And when the calves are eating this, then they were born with only one eye because the hedgehog pathway is very important in this stage. And they call it the cyclopamine, right, from cyclops. And uh, investigation and science went further because now this molecule produced by the plant is used in cancer therapy because some cancers are based on an overexpression of hedgehog pathway, so you can identify uh, cancer, okay, here, this is wrong, and then this molecule, slightly modified, is used for chemotherapy of these cancers, right? So, so this is a whole story which kind of connects these two, uh, the malformation which was observed in a calf, then up to cancer therapy, to just show you there are important pathways which play a role, and when something goes wrong, then you need to have a good therapy for doing this. And uh, so all this uh, is, of course, yeah, this, as I said, my last slide, and uh, my research group is uh, here in Bergen, and this is our photo with uh, some of the, some people disappeared already and went up to uh, form their own research groups. And then the funding comes from here, and of course, again, thank you for also this nice location. Uh, I'm not, I've never been here in this beautiful building. And uh, I want to thank you also for your attention and uh, want to finish with a nice uh, last picture. Thank you very much. So I think uh, you can ask me questions. What is the main liquid in the uh, first cell? Uh, yeah, so uh, the question was what is the main liquid in the first cell? So there we have a lot of nutrients, but it's also packed with lots of protein, and okay, nutrients are protein. There is also a lot of fat. Right, because fat is energy, and there's a lot of molecules, which are lipids, which then provide the energy for the further cell division, because all cell divisions cost uh, energy, and then you have it stu stuffed to there. But the molecules which the mother puts into the egg is messenger RNA, which uh, they, the mother produces and also puts in a specific region, right? The egg is looking like a round ball, but it's already subdivided into regions, which then get read out by the different cells. But it's mainly storage. It's like when you have a, a chicken egg for breakfast and you open it and all the, the, the stuff inside is very nutrient and protein rich, and this is what is in the egg. So usually what uh, the people do is uh, going for the DNA, so for the chromosomes, and do modification there. Because uh, one reason is because the DNA is also the molecule which is transferred to the next generation, right? 
So when you have the sperm swimming, it carries DNA and the uh, uh, egg also has DNA and they fuse together. And this is why we have uh, elements from our parents, from both parents. And when you do a modification there, then it's transferred to the next generation, right? And this is why they focus mainly on this and not so much hormones or something like this, yeah. The smallest listener. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Uh, so I did have a question about, you know, you showed the images when there was uh, the baby uh, fruit uh, uh, fire, yeah. uh, and so the cells were moving, uh, like kind of 100 cells, they were moving inside, choosing a special place to form like the, uh, the nervous system or another system. So uh, what does actually help them move to one special place? Is it electronic energy like uh, potassium and uh, sodium ions or is it uh, something different? Um, so for moving of cells, uh, you, uh, if, you have, if they are not pressured by the external contractions, then when they move, then they have these uh, like extensions from the membrane, which are philopodia, right? So these uh, extensions make them uh, attach to different size. So in principle, these cells can crawl along uh, an area where they have information. So also there the information is giving, okay, this is the road you have to migrate. And then these cells can go into this direction. Uh, so I have also another question about the type of cells. So uh, as you showed us, uh, at a certain point there were uh, a construction of muscles, what needs uh, well, actually, uh, some nervous cells yeah. to, be, uh, to be created. Yes. So, uh, uh, at the first, very first cell, there's like only one unique type. Yes. Uh, during the division of cells, uh, how one certain, so one certain type of cells formed or not around them? Yeah. So, um, so, the first cells in an embryo you can see as a stem cell, right? So it is multipotent, it can become everything. But then there's already a, a, additional information for each step, and the last information a cell received is the information of what cell type do you become, right? So there is a specific uh, uh, molecules expressed in each neuron, for example which is ELAV, which is a molecule which then binds also to DNA and makes a specific neuron, right? And then the cell knows, okay, I will become a neuron in the future. And then these cells get the information to connect specifically to muscles. Because at that time, the muscles also know already, okay, I will become a muscle. And then they get the information from the nervous system and neurons to contract and then you have, uh, it was a good observation from you, of course, you need a nervous system to have these contractions and at the same time, also the nervous system develops to make these contractions. Marci, uh, thank you for the lecture, it was very interesting and I think comprehensive. Uh, so, in this year, uh, a very interesting work on uh, squids, when uh, scientists uh, measure the expressions of certain genes which are involved in the uh, formation of appendages of vertebrates and uh, uh, arthropods, and to some extent of uh, animals. And, uh, uh, they made certain hypotheses that it is unlikely that our common ancestor also possessed uh, appendages. Uh, and uh, they made a statement about the so-called 
did publish it, that uh, there exists some, there exists some uh, conservative gene regulatory network which regulates the formation of appendages. Uh, is it or something else which were very primitive in our last common ancestor, but developed into something more complex in differential lateral uh, lineages. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, do you believe in uh, uh, what, how can you comment this concept uh, uh, of uh, dehomology? Mm -hmm. uh, is it likely that uh, our common ancestor possessed some primitive uh, appendages like uh, antenna of Ranavakaris or something like this, of Ikaya? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a specialist question. Uh, so, uh, uh, the re re reference here is to um, a gene cascade, like a combination of transcription factors which are expressed in the same arrangement in uh, the leg of a fly and also in the octopus arm. And uh, the idea here is, uh, so, so is this indicating when it's the same transcription factor cascade that also the last common ancestor had legs or something like this. And this is usually called uh, deep homology, which means homology is a, a common origin and deep in time means very, very long time ago. And uh, so what the study did not do is that they looked for these genes where they are expressed in animals which don't have legs, right? Because uh, what we know that these genes are present in uh, animals which also don't have legs, right? So, so they haven't lost these genes, they are still present. And uh, which is fun because my lab is now looking for exactly these genes in animals which have no legs, right? Because we are looking in this and we found, for example, that these genes cascade is also expressed in a small extension of a larva from uh, random worms, foronids, right? And, and you have this expression in everything what is a out budding, kind of, of the body. And one of the tip genes, distalis, which is expressed on the most distal part, uh, on the tip of each arm, which uh, is, for example, also expressed in nervous system, right? And the idea connection here is that for making antenna and sensory organs, it is of advantage to have an extension out of the body. And that this gene cascade was mainly uh, 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 there for sensing the outer world. And in some animals, this uh, out pockets uh, were to uh, evolve to widen the uh, range of feelings because also at the tip of the octopus arm are neurons, right? And they also need to touch and catch prey. And this is likely the primary function of this cascade is in the nervous system. And then later got used multiple times, maybe independently, for making also outgrowths out of the body. And uh, this is a common thing. Uh, in what we observe when we study different animal development that the same tools have been used over and over again. And I use deep homology only for things we don't know yet because the solution for this question is not yet known and uh, we will know later and then maybe we don't call it deep homology anymore when we have really an idea how this evolved. Thank you so much for And you mentioned it is very uh, important how the cells communicate between each other. And uh, the question is, is this process different in uh, the other types of uh, living beings, like in plants or fungi, uh, than in animals? Is this something special about cell communication in animals? Okay. Yes, uh, so, so what is known about, so, so coming from a single cell organism to a multicellular organism, 
There is one pathway in the animals which this happened, but then there is another way, of course, plants have done this, this uh, uh, also, and fungi, so when you think about eating mushrooms, they also have become multicellular, right? And this uh, events happened independently in evolution, and interestingly, they use different pathways. So the animal-specific pathways are uh, specific to animals. Like these pathways I've shown you, they are not in plants, right? So these are specific animals for making multicellular animals. And this is what has been used, which was present in these like single-celled organisms. Many of these genes were present and then leading to multicellular animals. And, but the animals use different pathways than plants and mushrooms. First question is about ears. Why different people or not uh, relatively connected have the same ears uh, in the cell? Or is it a gene that is responsible for this kind of stuff? What's the second question? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the question was, uh, why do uh, people have different ears, right? But same. Same ears, so. They're not uh, connected, so they're not relatives, because he... He's the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have to uh, look very carefully at the ears. <laughs> they are not always the same, right? Uh, so, so, for example, here this can be lick. Uh, uh, sorry, this can be large, and some people don't even have this, right? And this is genetic. Yes. This is uh, molecular information which often comes from your parents uh, which makes the ear shape. But it doesn't mean that when your friend has the same ears as you that the parents are the same. Okay, yes. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, uh, I might not have a good answer, but it could be that uh, it's an evolution question because Vertebrates, this would be my, now my answer, they are vertebrates like uh, lizards and or uh, birds uh, which have um, not five digits but uh, only four, right? So when you start uh, from one, all this st all start with the same starting point also birds, when they make the wing, right, they all start with the same uh, uh, point, but then doing the programmed cell death can decide to have only four fingers or a bird wing. And this is the ancestry, I would say, which imprints this similarity at the beginning 
and then the differences, and for this it's a uh, uh, waste of evolutionary time maybe, but uh, it's, it's easier to make differences by starting this way. I hope this is a satisfying answer. Yeah. No, uh, so, so um, the sequence of body part formation uh, is different between species. So, uh, or let's say uh, larger distances. You can make first the nervous system and then the musculature. You can also first make the musculature and then the nervous system, for example. So there's a time shifting possible, right? But of course, the cells have to be internalized to form the inner organs, and uh, this is the thing. But between species, there's a different organization of how, when you do what. And with larger evolutionary distance, the distance, uh, differences can be uh, very, very different. So, and this is called even, there is a name for it, heterochrony, which means a shift of timing of developmental processes to each other and uh, heterochrony from the timing, different timing. And this is uh, not always the same. And uh, for example, uh, we have an animal who has probably liver and went to make another liver. Will the process of kind of building up from a single cell to the whole liver be different from, uh, like for the embryo and for the liver the microscope or like mm -hmm. So um, the adult processes uh, to make a liver is very similar to making the embryonic liver. So there are very a lot of similarities and this is also why cancer is using uh, the embryological pathways for forming tumors. So it is all these developmental processes are still active to some extent in our body, and this is why our cells have the information. But during the embryonic development, uh, there is a possibility that neighbor cells can replace the function of a cell which might die. Right? It can happen in uh, the development of humans that in the very early stages suddenly uh, cell dies which were supposed to give rise to the liver. And then the neighbor cells says, oh shit, yeah, it, passed the, it died, so uh, now my function is to replace the cell which is more important than my function to do the other stuff. So there is this uh, rescue uh, point to some extent in embryonic development as well. One question. Thank you for the lecture. It was very interesting. Um, my question is, uh, you said that uh, one cell generates uh, molecules that uh, then transfer to another cell, and this uh, changes the weight to light. Um, my question is, uh, how do molecules know uh, which uh, cell they are, they are going? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, both is possible. So it has been observed in animals that uh, there's one plane diffusion, so it's more random, right? So that you can, uh, one cell secretes ligands throughout and they spread equally uh, to the neighbors. And then it's a de depending on the concentration. So the cells very far away receive only one or two of these molecules. And the closer cells, they receive uh, more molecules and after, above a specific threshold, then this cell becomes uh, the information to become a different cell. But also in the, for example, making the fly segments, and likely also here the caterpillar, uh, the segmentation, the so indentation, there is a guided information. So the information, these ligands are transported only in one direction and not in the other. And this is even better for making sharp boundaries and giving not the same information to the other segments who really make sure there is a straight line, right? And also these stripes in Drosophila where you have these uh, nice stripes in the embryo, these are also often made by uh, directed information. So it's both happening. So I always, uh, I started with by myself reading uh, Scott Gilbert's book, Developmental Biology, and there you have the whole information in this book from the molecular pathways and also evolutionary aspects there. So. Um, this is an area which is not well investigated yet. So, so the gr uh, impact of gravity on embryogenesis is, of course, the best experiments are done in space, right? Because then you can exclude gravity. Otherwise, you can, of course, put them in a centrifuge and then uh, 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 study their development afterwards, so where you impose different gravity. In many cases, it does not really uh, uh, play an important role, but there are some described places where it matters, right, the gravity aspect. And also, for example, uh, uh, that you have ion gradients, like electri electric gradients. This, for example, in the chicken embryo uh, is an important thing, that you have a specific gradient of electricity there to then make and organize the cells and give an information. And so there are some rare cases, yes, but uh, mainly it's going by these molecules. Thank you very much uh, for the question. I have a question about uh, prolonged death of cells. Uh, I think it's not a secret that it's, uh, we die uh, at this or that period of time, like we have a length of life, and it's, it, it depends on the food we eat, on uh, the place where we live, right, and stuff like that. Do we have, um, from the embryo stage, do we have uh, pre-programmed uh, death cells or something like that that influence uh, lines of life? That's uh, going a little bit out of my uh, uh, area. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about the status, what is now. There was a time when people said that the telomeres in the chromosomes uh, are important. So for example, you have each of these uh, DNA bases, they have a tip of uh, which is not uh, copied. 
or only partially copied with the, to the next generation of the sales. And then when the sales have done uh, sufficient, say, or a lot of cell divisions, then they know, okay, I'm over. I don't divide anymore, right? And this is in fact happening what, uh, in our body, right? So, so at some point, the, the organs do not get replaced with fresh cells. There are no cell divisions anymore. And then, uh, so it happens usually what I've heard every seven years where our whole body or nearly the whole body is replaced by new cells. And then after a number of times, it might be these telomeres, uh, but it might be something different now what the people look at. But there is a kind of a program there. There is an element. And this explains why a sea turtle can, a turtle can become 300 years or 400 years old. And then humans, they have their limit around 90 or 100. This is now totally in fashion to do this, right? Building uh, new organs uh, uh, out of cell cultures. And with a goal, of course, in medicine to make at some point uh, new hearts just by uh, building, taking like stem cells and giving them the right information. And this is here what is important, right? You need to add them uh, the correct information that they know that they should become a liver cell. Right? And then they build a liver. And some cells are really organizing themselves into uh, specific regions, even uh, autonomous, so you don't have to add something uh, as, a, as a liquid or a, a fluid to this, which gives them the information. And, uh, but, but this is the main goal here, to get organs out of the dish, which then, in the optimal case, get implanted to the human body to replace uh, sick uh, organs. Yes? Okay. <laughs> uh, in principle, uh, yes. So uh, jellyfish is a good example. So you have there like uh, 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 Hydra, which is a well investigated uh, re relative of jellyfish or so. They uh, make new Hydras all their life and you cannot even say when they are dead. Of course, when you smash with a hammer on the animal, then they are also dead but they don't uh, die by themselves. So they can reproduce a new and new offspring and there's fresh cells everywhere. And this is also why people study them to maybe find the secret of aging there and uh, that, that one can stop the aging. So, so the body they had, it dies and they produce the new one? No. The body stays alive. But with cells, some cells uh, die and they produce. Yes, yes. Thank you. 
it's got like uh, doesn't help has this problem with uh, the body resistance mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. accepting that yeah. Uh, the ultimate goal and what people try is to use human stem cells, so undifferentiated cells, uh, and from the same human if possible, right? And then you can extract these cells, give them the information to build a liver, and then put the liver inside. But of course, the science starts first with trying to do this with pigs, for example, like using pig cells, and then, but then we know that uh, there's a huge resistance, or can be a huge resistance of the body to expel the organ, right? But uh, people managed already to build, uh, I mean, when you, when you use stem cells of an animal, you first start with uh, the pigs, for example, and try to establish the methods there before you do this with human stem cells, right? So this is science in progress. Uh, so as you just mentioned, uh, during our early uh, growing up, we traced the path of our ancient ancestors, so that's why we look like a fish and uh, frogs. Uh, and so is it somehow possible to speed up to accelerate uh, our growing up, at least in this uh, few, some the first months at least, and not to cut the other stages and to come directly to the, the shape you want. Ah, uh, um, I, this is now a guess also, a guess answer, because I don't know if somebody wanted to speed up the development of any animal or so, but uh, what uh, is here the case that uh, the timing is very important, that uh, each species has a specific timing of how, when to develop what, and the whole information transformation is orchestrated according to this timing, because timing is here important. Also, like when you think about the diffusion of a molecule to the next, it needs to diffuse uh, and needs a specific time for this. And then when you speed this up, everything would have to happen faster. And there are chemical processes, there are physical processes, and all these processes have different speeds. And this is, for example, uh, yeah, uh, you cannot really speed up a development of an invertebrate. You can speed it up a little bit. I know, for example, when you record the development of a, of a worm, like Sinoaptitis elegans, you can do this at 24 degrees or 31 degrees. And they use a different timing for this, but you cannot go to an extreme there. Right? It still needs to function, and the first process, which then doesn't work, stops the whole embryogenesis. Thank you. She wants a book. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have already talked about one of uh, Greek ancient uh, cycles, uh, the one mythological creature, and I was thinking about another one. Um, might it be possible to um, form a totally new organ for, uh, for example, for a human being of you know, another like, competitive creature like a butterfly to make means, a butterfly want means for a human? Is it somehow possible? Uh, so, um, this is. Uh, a good question, right? It's about a specific, uh, what is often used as a constraint in de development. So, so can it be that we are born like angels, right? A angels have arms and legs, and, uh, but then they also have additional wings, which uh, look very much like bird wings, uh, on the back. And uh, so Louis Wolpert, I, he used this slide of an angel in a developmental biology talk, so this is the guy with the gastrulation is the most important thing in your life, to exactly raise this question, right? Can we ever be angels in a way that we have wings on the back? Uh, and uh, this is, he said no, right? Because the material is not really there uh, to, to, make, uh, to make wings. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say uh, totally no. Uh, not in our life, yes, uh, but uh, who knows 
where uh, human would be evolving, right? Uh, and they, we have other cases where there are uh, animals having evolved a new wing, additional uh, things, and uh, why not? You just need to give it a specific time there. But uh, it will not be a butterfly wing likely. It will be more likely like a bird wing or something like this. 